Okay, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Tuesday, January 8th meeting of the Cape Elizabeth School Board. Um, if we would all rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Do we have any adjustments? Uh, I'd like us to strike item A. We want to hold that to the February board meeting. 6A, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Is Anything else? For the public, what, that, what 6A is? Uh, 6A is a leave request for a high school teacher, and um, we haven't had an opportunity to discuss it. It was originally planned for the February board meeting. Thank you, Meredith. Mm -hmm. Okay, item two is approval of school board minutes from um, three previous meetings. Maybe we can do this as a slate. May I have a motion? Um, I move that we approve the school board minutes, um, the special meeting caucus on Monday, December 10th, 2012, the executive session Tuesday, December 11th, 2012, and the regular business Tuesday, December 12th, as a slate. Second. I take it. Okay. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Okay. Um, comments by our student representatives. I don't see the middle school here today, so I guess we'll go right to Nolan and Abby. Abby? Hi. Hi. <laughs> okay, so the semester is coming to an end at the high school, which means the dreaded midterms. <clears throat> That will be um, two weeks, not next week, but the week after. So I know everyone's dreading those. Um, we also have a Cape Fusion this weekend, which everyone's really excited about. We're going to have um, the blow-up obstacle course in the pool, also one in the gym, I believe, and a cupcake decorating station, which I'm really excited about. Um, and then seniors are hearing from colleges, which is very exciting. Um, Nolan. All right, uh, you kind of uh, caught us in, in a bit of a lull here, just after vacation, before midterms. So there's not a whole lot more to report, but uh, we did actually, uh, the junior class uh, selected a location for the senior prom, which is uh, the Portland Club. Um, and also the seniors formed a graduation committee uh, and they'll be working on things like a, a class gift um, and that's that's mainly the focus of the student council our senior year's graduation um, and then also underclassmen have been uh, recently got their PSAT scores back um, so that's pretty much what's going on thank you any questions for the representatives Okay. Um, so item four, comments from public, the public on agenda items. Seeing no comments from the public, we'll move to item five, communications. Um, 5A, the Chiwanki documentary and award. And we have Lisa Stevens here to talk I'm about that. Help her out by getting the protector. Okay. Is this on? Is this on? Okay. Um, I'm Lisa Stevens. I am a representative from the um, Middle School Parents Association, and my title is um, Middle School Parents Association Outdoor Experience Committee Co-Chair, right? <laughs> so um, I'm co-chair with Sarah Page, fifth grade parent. Um, Pam Torrey, our president of the um, Parents Association, is here as well, and we um, are very excited about this documentary that PBS put on. It's called Visionaries, um, and they do a series um, that profiles the work of nonprofits. And every year they pick five or six nonprofits to to um, do a documentary about. And last year they did Chiwanki. And our Cape students, sixth graders, happened to be there during that um, filming of it. So I'm just going to go ahead and show you the clip. I mean the film the first eight minutes of it. 
beautiful blue screen. Is it about the ocean? <laughs> I, the sky is never that blue in Chuanki in, in March. Wow. Let's see. It was supposed to show me. It was working. Talk a little more <laughs> while, while you figure while out. I play so the, um, the creator of the Visionary series and the executive producer of this film was at our, um, our premiere, which was held December 10th, something like that. Um, and he um, goes around the world and, and uh, to all these nonprofits. And he had so many positive things to say about the Cape Kids. It was really moving, and, um, and he was just very, very impressed by our students and the whole Chewankee experience. So, um, you ready? I think so. So that film's going to go national probably end of January, February, I think, of this year. So we're going to put the word out there once we actually have the date and make sure people know. So, And it, it was a huge boost for the program, not only for Chewanki, but for the uh, people of Cape Elizabeth, too. Um, as you know, that was 26 years. We're, uh, this sixth grade class is going to be number 27. So, um, And I can say that since the budget was cut in 2009, Every year we've had to raise $12,000 to get that class to go, and this current sixth grade class has $66 to go. So it's very doable. So, um, and Chewankee, um gave Cape Elizabeth an award. Um, and this is what it says. Um, Chewankee proudly presents its 2012 Chewankee Champion Award to Cape Elizabeth Middle School in honor of Principal Steve Connolly, the sixth grade faculty, and the Cape Elizabeth Middle School Parents Association. Their dedication to transformative outdoor learning has opened the minds and hearts of Cape Elizabeth students to the wonder of the natural world. So this is presented to everybody. So, that's it. Any questions or anything? I actually have a question, John. What? How did you raise the money? Uh, I know every year it's a, you know, you try different ways and I'm amazed that you only have $66 to go. Well, we've worked very hard, the uh, Parents Association, for the past three years to come up with something that can um, be sustainable for, for future grades. So last year, last January, we reached down into Pond Cove grades, and we kindergarten through eighth grade to raise money for outdoor experiences. We have our clink bottle return that was started that has right now... Um, close to $16,000 since we started that program. I know, it's huge. Every little bottle counts. <laughs> um, we have our Hannaford gift card program where you buy gift cards at Hannaford's and they give us 5% back. Mm -hmm. So every $1,000 we get $50. Um, so in that program, since we started that last January, has brought in $8,000. Mm -hmm. um, last year's um, eighth grade class gives a gift back to the school. Um, and they chose to give money back to the fifth grade class for their Chewankee trip. So um, people make um, personal donations to Chewankee on behalf of the class. Um, people make personal donations to the Parents Association on behalf of the class. So, and it all it adds up. So right now, kindergarten has funds for their Chewankee trip. Wow. So it's across the board. So, and we're doing a lot of programs to make that go without having to do another fundraiser selling something or no. you know so and that's the important part yeah so thank you and to get the kids involved mm -hmm. any other questions thank you lisa mm -hmm. thanks thank you thanks Thanks for the lights. 
Okay, so we'll move to B, school safety. I'm wondering if we might be able to move to C, um, as Mr. Thorick is also covering the high school okay. Okay. basketball games this evening. <laughs> Absolutely. So item C, as Jeff comes up here, is the um, evaluation of coaching staff and extracurricular staff. Can I say something real quick? On uh, I just want to thank um, all the middle school uh, parents association. I know there's uh, you're you're busy. You have children in school, and I think it's fantastic that you uh, give your time. And um, you know, obviously, there's uh, always uh, you know constraints on fundraising. But I've heard wonderful things about broadening the Shawanki experience. It's not only for sixth grade, but it's really a community initiative so I just want to thank you for the time you spent on this and uh, supporting the program and it, it's very rewarding and helpful for, for us to see um, you know the work that the community does so thank you very much mm -hmm. so, sorry about that okay. <laughs> thank you Michael okay uh, just going to talk a little bit about the uh, coaching evaluation process so been an athletic director now for 12 years and I had an opportunity to look at a number of different models and experiment to uh, see what works well and what may not work so well. Uh, I, th I believe the coaching evaluation model that we have pl in place now um, is it, it's a fairly comprehensive process and it, it's something that occurs throughout the entire season, not just at the end of the season. Um, it's a culmination of daily conversations, observations, surveys, evaluations, and postseason meetings. So to begin, one of the things I try to do is make myself as visible as possible and as accessible as possible. Start by establishing solid relationships uh, with students, parents, coaches, and um, obviously uh, the importance of communication as well. So daily conversations uh, is something that we're very fortunate at Cape Elizabeth having as many faculty coaches as we do. Uh, that allows an opportunity for me to meet with coaches daily and it could be something as simple as just you know, how a game went to some problem solving um, situations. So we, and in the high school we have 14 faculty coaches and in middle school we have 10 faculty coaches so that's pretty impressive that's a great number and it and certainly improves that communication process uh, with students really try to build uh, trustworthy and respectful relationships so students feel comfortable to coming in and meeting with me if there are ish team issues or, or something with a coach so I can help guide them um, or or help uh, facilitate uh, that process with a coach or with maybe another teammate and then with parents, I also think having that solid relationship is, is, is vital. Um, it provides an opportunity. Again, simple conversations, being approachable, simple conversations that will make some of those more difficult conversations that there may be in the future a little bit easier. Um, so building that really uh, trusting and uh, positive relationship with parents is, is vital as well. Um, second component is observation. And that could be at practices, it could be at competitions. I think one of our benefits, again, for Cape Elizabeth is having all of our facilities right here on campus. Uh, provides, for instance, in the spring, there could be a tennis match, uh, track meet, baseball, softball games, and lacrosse games going on the same day. So that allows me some time to kind of uh, observe and uh, see how things are going and um, provide feedback if necessary to the coaches or um, even have some conversations with students if, if that's necessary as well. Uh, and in the high school we have about 325 home games a year so that's um, a great opportunity for me again to, to uh, catch up and, and observe what's going on there and in the middle school we have about 180 games. Um, so, and I think that's probably my favorite part of the job, is having that opportunity to uh, observe and, and um, provide feedback there. Third component to this is, are the surveys. Uh, there's a parent and a student survey that are done online. These are confidential. Uh, they help identify areas of strengths and areas of improvements. 
um, looking for themes in the, in the surveys, uh, and they're also helpful in the postseason meeting in that part of the process. And those are included in your packet. They're the pink copy is the parent, and the blue is the student. So they're a little bit different. Categories are the same, but the, um, the wording might be a little bit different, and some of the questions might be a little different. The, these, these are posted online at the end of each season, uh, November uh, for the fall, and February for the winter sports, and June in the spring. The response, oh, and I also, get, the information is sent out in um, the uh, High School Parents Association and Middle School Parents Association newsletter as well. The response to the surveys varies. Uh, on average, probably for students and parents, uh, 40 to 50. Um, we have about 260 to 270 students participating each season in the high school, so that number definitely could improve. Fall and winter, I think they're a little bit higher. Spring, definitely, that number is a lot lower. Um, I think part of that, too, has to do with everything that's going on outside of athletics. Uh, really looking for a wide range of responses in those surveys. So it's really important, I think, to get that feedback um, and really encourage students, parents to uh, participate in that process. I think one of the areas that I'm looking at now is how to, um, I think the student feedback we get, it, it's, it's candid, it's honest, genuine. I think it's really, really helpful. Um, and trying to think of a way to uh, get that out so we can get a better response rate. And you know, one of my thoughts was maybe using a practice at the, towards the end of the season. And I think having iPads now um, will improve that process dramatically. I mean, that's just a, another awesome, since it's online, it's a tremendous resource and one that i um, definitely looking forward to take advantage of. Uh, the fourth component involves an evaluation, and that's something, there's a head coach evaluation, and that's in your packet as well. Uh, head coach evaluation is green, and sub-varsity evaluation is yellow. Head coach evaluations are done by the athletic director, and sub-varsity are done by the head coach of each program, and that includes assistant coaches. Uh, this is something that I do at the end of this, so we'll, we'll complete the uh, evaluation forms um, and then use that information uh, in the end of the season meetings that I have with the, with the coaches and the coaching staff. So it includes some checkbox type responses where acceptable needs improvement or may not be applicable, uh, and then there are also some narratives. Um, there's six categories in the uh, head coach evaluation process. Uh, planning and preparation, knowledge, program management, and organization, climate, process of coaching, and outcomes of coaching. So we're addressing uh, each one of those categories in, in, in that part of the uh, evaluation process. And then, the end of the season, meet with um, the coaching staff of each sport and gender, um, so, for instance, it could be the girls' soccer program or the field hockey program. Um, there are times where I may meet independently as well, if, if that's necessary. Uh, and then there's, some also, then there's also a, a time to have follow-up conversations as well. Um, in that review, we're looking at the evaluations. We're looking at goals for the season, trying to identify goals for the following season. Um, looking at professional growth opportunities and um, sometimes even an action plan if, if, if that's required. So it's, uh, again, it's, it's a fairly comprehensive, it's a fairly, um, it's a fair process. I think that works pretty well, provides a lot of direction, it, it uh, provides some reflection, um, guidance, and uh, hopefully I think it allows uh, a positive experience for everyone involved. So.
That's it, quickly in a nutshell. I'm sure there are some questions, but uh, I can probably give a little more detail in, in question, but I kind of just wanted to give an overview of, of that process. Uh, Jeff, I had a couple questions. I think I got recognized, didn't I, John? I saw him not recognized. Did you not admit that? I, I did not. Okay. I did recognize you, David. I did um, see Mary Sam, but I'll get to her. I, I'm curious about some of the numbers. I, I think I, I sped read uh, these questionnaires. They're very thorough. I particularly like the parent and the ath athlete ones because they feed into what I assume are your evaluations or the evaluator, and that's where you're going to get someone who's actually living it day to day. But your response rate, if I, you said 40 to 50, I assume that's numbers, not percent? Yeah, that's what I want Numbers. Yep. And if you said 200 students, there's more than 200 students if you count. If my son does three sports, it counts as three students? So each season, approximately 260. 200 per, se per season? Yeah. So again, four, 40 to 50 per season. season. Okay. Some seasons, like for instance in the fall and winter, winter, mm -hmm. the response rate is a little better. It's probably the best. That's probably in that 80, 80 range. Um, 80 responses. I, I, 80 responses. I, I find these things extremely valuable. I haven't talked to you about them in the past and haven't been involved in them. And, I, and I'm just wondering, I, I agree with you that there's got to be a way to up it because if you have 200 students and you assume one parent will fill it out, you get 40 to 50 out of 300. It's not a great yield. Um, I, People could give you all kinds of suggestions. One of them maybe is I like your idea of maybe at the end of the season, the coach gives one hour of a practice where everybody sits down. They're told they have to show up, mandatory practice, and they fill them out. I know what you try to do to get kids to do it, but it's really hard to herd the cats in the room after the season. Uh, but I, I personally think what the students say and what the parents say, well, particularly the students, would be extremely valuable. And whatever you can think of to up the rate, I think would be really helpful. Yep. And, that's, and that's an ongoing process, and again, a very, uh, you know, if people have any suggestions or... Well, I, my, my suggestion would be is that you require the coaches at the end of the season, towards the end of the season, to devote one hour, one practice. It doesn't take that long for a kid to fill this out, yeah. or half hour. They all, you know, bring their notebooks, their iPads, excuse me, and fill it out. Yeah. And, and probably done faster they could probably do it in five to ten minutes. Well, I, I, I was using me as an example. Yeah. It would take me that long. But it is, you know, it, it's precise information. It may be in phrases, but it is uh, that the narrative piece to those is very helpful. No doubt about it. Mary? Um, David, you asked some of my questions. In terms of parents, though, and getting more parent input, I mean, I, I think the student input's the most important, but um, not everybody reads through the, the HSPA newsletter all the way through. Um, I, I know even I myself sometimes don't read all the way through. Do you have access to parents' emails so you could send them a direct email to ask them to fill it out? Yep. Um, I could probably do that through um, Jeff. Yeah, that for me that would be more informative than you know having to happening to just go online and see it there. Um, a reminder like that might be helpful. Um, uh, um, what were my other questions? Um, and the timing of it is is tricky too because different teams end at different points, and right. to send a blanket email at that point where some of the other teams are still playing, that can sometimes pose some conflict. So I try to get it where most of the teams have finished, and that's why I like that beginning of November. By that point, um, maybe the boosters or the, um, let's say, boosters or even the coaches could send out a <coughs> reminder with a yeah. link. It's coming up, and then yeah. it's Jeff. Yeah, with a link. That, I mean, that, that's just one suggestion. Yeah. Um, for parents, but I, I like the idea, your idea of and um, of having the kids fill it out during, you know, bef before one practice or something. That makes sense. Um, in terms of the evaluations, and maybe I missed this, um, your evaluation form. Do you just fill this evaluation form out for the coaches and hand it to them as a compilation of all of the evaluations that you've gotten? So, in that end of the season meeting. 
-hmm. with the coaches, that's part of that process is uh -huh. the evaluation. Okay. Um, and while the the individual comments are confidential, you just you're looking at, at overall themes. Yeah, and there are times where th that will be a private conversation as opposed to with the coaching staff. Right. Um, if if that's necessary. Okay. Yeah. Great. Great. And again, I mean, it works well because it takes a look at the program as not you know it, i think it, there's the coaching piece that's important but it's also the program and mm -hmm. identifying areas that we can improve and a lot of times that may mean an area that a coach needs to improve on mm -hmm. to make that program a little bit um whatever whatever the issue may be that's great. And you're, you are the sole person who looks at all of the evaluations and has to compilate all the, of them? The online survey, the, yeah. um, I mean, I think if someone had to look at them, Jeff or Meredith, but, yeah, but they come in directly to me. Yeah, no one, no one else has access to that. So it's, I, I'd say on the student, I don't even ask for a name. Mm -hmm. um, on the parent one, I do put a spot in there. and. Believe it or not, I'll, I would say at least 50% 50, 50 of them uh, have a name on them, which is, I think that's admirable and, and uh, mm -hmm. shows that they care about the program and um, not trying to make any situations that may be uncomfortable, but want to do what's best for kids. Right, right. Good. Uh, I think Joe is next. We've got a lot of questions. Sorry. Well, no, Mary and David oh, were actually very comprehensive in asking the questions, and, and some of the suggestions that I was coming up with, I think Mary covered. Um, on the um, survey itself, when you, when you hand it to the kids, um, is it a paper survey that they fill out and then hand back to you? Online. So it's, all, online it's a survey. survey. It's an electronic so survey. Electronic survey in the form of the actual form, or is it something like a survey monkey where it compiles? It's similar to like a survey. It's the Google Docs form. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so that what you have is just basically I photocopied the, yeah. the version of it. I confess I've never seen a link to a survey, and you know my oldest is a sophomore, um, and my youngest is a jock. So um, I, I think I just I'm one of those parents that may not read all the way down to the bottom, and I apologize for that because I would have loved to. And I do try to include that it's really helpful information. It's strictly confidential, um, and. Another thought I just had too was putting it on, um, like for instance, in the high school, Jeff's principal page. I mean, I think there are ways of definitely Take getting that damage. information out. Um, and the other just comment as chair of the policy committee, I appreciate you bringing this policy to our attention. We are working through our manual, um, slogging through, I think would be the best term for it. Um, right now we're on the B's. So, you make it sounds so unpleasant. <laughs> <laughs> and there's gulags. Or, um, so you know, when we get to the J's, I mean, it seems like a, a fine policy now, but um, we'll be looking forward to reviewing yep. it more comprehensively with the. Always room for improvement. And um, again, I do think having, instead of taking it from right from the beginning of the season and, and taking that proactive approach as opposed to just filling something out after the season and then you know, if, if there are some issues that need to be addressed, you can take care of them. And I'm a huge advocate of being proactive in those mm -hmm. when something like that happens or, or even positive, something good. Yeah. Uh, Kate? Um, I have a question about with the responses in the light of mission and vision and all the work that has just been done, you probably get the rawest data or information about what the kids are thinking and the themes. Um, you might, you might not. I, I would think that you would. I'd say the student perspective or the student responses are, are pretty balanced. Um, a lot of the parental response seems to be on extreme ends, but not as much. In the, that's why I think it's important to have a lot of response, a, a higher response rate. I was wondering, who do you, how do you share that with, who do you share that information with? Administrators, social workers, guidance. I know that everything's confidential for per child, but do we have an avenue of making it a one school, um, sports and arts and education, everything going on in the halls? 
kind of way to mesh um, this is a red flag or you know how, how do you or this is going really well can we work more towards this or do you, do you know what I, I guess mean? yeah I think it would depend on the situation if it was something that um, might have been like a school type issue that was I was seeing some red flags and yeah. then I would definitely address that with with Jeff and Troy and um, but in general it's I'm pulling a theme so in general we're I'm pulling themes um, and have in putting those into the evaluation paper and then using that tool to have conversations with coaches. And so it's mostly coaches but not administration? Okay. Yeah, there's some, I mean, I think I know. there are times where, where I may have had a conversation with Jeff about certain, uh, something that may have popped up or, um, but like, for, like a climate type thing or, yeah, I, I think I understand where you're. Yeah, that's going. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Michael? <clears throat> sure, I think, uh, you know, uh, as a coach, it would be difficult being evaluated by parents. Uh, you know, they may have different expectations. So my question is, um, you know, do we, how, is this um, part of our overall effort, you know, for uh, if any child, any family, any parent that's presented support, they understand, you know, here's the Cape Elizabeth Code of Conduct. Here are expectations for, uh, you know, for coaches, for parents, for students. So no matter what sport you play, you know, there's common values like sportsmanship, teamwork. So when I'm evaluating a coach, I know those were the expectations. Obviously, you know, there's a big focus on achievement. You know, they need to, if it's soccer, look cross, but, um, you know, if I just got one of these and I'd, I may evaluate him, I may think my child's the best soccer player and I'm upset that he didn't get to play every game, but do we have a, you know, for every extracurricular or athletic program, here are the values and the expectations. So when you evaluate these coaches, that's the prism the school board and the communities prioritizes. So, um, I'm, you know, is that something we're doing? Because, you know, just I know from, you know, so a lot of it's code of conduct and it's managing parental expectations, but if we had a holistic, it, here's what we expect from every child and every participant, you sign off on this code of conduct. And is that part of how yeah, is that almost, integrated with our evaluation pol or strategies? Sure. It, almost if we were to include our uh, beliefs and philosophies, which is in that um, policy manual, um, and use that, maybe encourage people to kind of look through that in advance and then complete. Um, but it, again, it's timing. You know, we don't want to do it maybe right after a banquet. You know, so it, it's, it's finding that right time as well. So uh, responses are objective. And, but I, I, I like that idea. Of, yeah, I was just thinking, you know, for my child to play, I have to sign this code of, con you know, I agree this is how, these are the, you know, this is how we, uh, you know, uh, live the values well, of the Cape Elizabeth community and you sign it and you, you have integrity and you hold yourself to that and that way the coaches, I think, would be, uh, you know, evaluate me um, that this is what we agreed on where, you know, I coach sports, you know, younger and that's the biggest challenge, you know, you have one parent uh, you know, has one expectation, and if it's like, well, here's what what we're focusing on, and if you know, if, they may not, you may not agree with that, but you agreed to participate in it, and these were, you know, the kind of what we're expected to do. So, if I was evaluating a coach, I would know, okay, if sportsmanship was something that you know I decided we we're going to do, and you know, I would be able to better evaluate them on on that, and it would be the same regardless of whichever extracurricular or athletic program. So that's my two, two cents. The, the nice thing with that survey, it, it does ask questions that are going to probe a little bit further than playing time. Um, so I think that and then having my observations um, and student feedback, you know, taking all of that information, all that data, and kind of presenting it, hopefully will eliminate some of that misdirection. Jeff, I had a, a, a pretty similar question. I think you hinted at the answer, but 
<clears throat> I just want to confirm that, that you mentioned climate as, as one of the points of the evaluation of a coach. Where, so where is that climate defined, that, that climate ideal defined? You'll see it in the philosophy and beliefs, uh, the okay. school's philosophy and beliefs that's in that. Um, it's another yeah. athletic it's in a, it's in It's defined in school board policy? Yeah. Okay. It's um, not a separate athletic. No, no, no. That's, a, okay. yeah, that's something that we follow, and um, the coaches have copies of that information. And going through our interview process when we're hiring candidates, those are questions that we ask in the committee, philosophy, beliefs, and... Yeah, absolutely, that's a, that's a key part to, to the um, athletic program. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? JJ, I. Is uh, the policy code? I have. Yes, sir. Just, just to let you know, I, I once, I think last year with Jeff, looked at the various policies we have, and they're not exactly completely consistent in terms of what our philosophy is and how do we grade and what are our goals in sports and so forth. And Jeff led me through it, and I could see it was inconsistent. So I think of something for, I was mentioning it, that we should take a look at as a policy committee. If I can make a suggestion, um, I don't know when they sign the athletic contract at the beginning of the year. Do we include in that, let's suppose we had a, a great, this is our philosophy and this is what we're trying to achieve by sports. It, we could include that with part of the, as part of the contract. Yeah. And because the parent signs it and a kid signs it, so we could attach it. Um, if we had a unified set of philosophies and goals and code of conduct, et cetera, we could, could have put it as part of that contract. So that would at least alert parents to what we expect. Secondly, I, I, this worked well, and um, I noticed it in at least one sport. Uh, a, a, a email uh, was created, an email list of all the parents of kids on the team. And maybe when a kid signs up for a team, they have to give their email, or at least the parent's email. In which case, there was constant communication between the coach and the parents all season long. And as part of that, if you, if you required that, it would also give you the opportunity to make sure that the parent got one of these forms to fill out because you could you have a ready-made list if you made it as a, as a requirement. And then I would, again, reemphasize that in the next to last meeting, it, the coach is required to have the kids sit down for 10 minutes, 5 minutes, 30 seconds, and fill out one of those forms. Okay, because uh, I, I look at these forms. If you look at the climate questions in here, um, the, the good down. ones. So it's, it's really a matter of just click, right. click, click, and then there is opportunity for some narrative, but But as I said, if, 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 if you want parents to get it, I can tell you in cross country we had a list of all the parents, and whenever we had something to say, they said the coach had something to say, he reported every week on every event, it was really well done. If, if, if that was created for all sports, you have a list that, so you can get the parents to have the list, and um, my other suggestion would have the students do it as their last practice, but I, I find these forms excellent. You can't possibly look at every coach. I mean, I'm sure you've seen your car there for 12 hours. You do close to it, but you can't possibly watch every sport all the time and catch all the nuances. I think this is a great way to do it. Thank you. And, and we've got to let Jeff uh, off the hook here and back to the basketball game, but I think Meredith has one Well, just two quick for... points. One in response to the email access. One of the challenges with our current system is that we don't have easy access. Mr. Perley and I worked together for a long period of time after school one day just trying to easily pull email addresses for one class of students. It's a cumbersome process right now with the way our software is set up. So, it's, so ideally, when we upgrade the software, which is something that we're looking at in the next year budget cycle, we'll be able to have some of the flexibility to easily capture that kind of data and have a easily controlled email at, address list that Jeff could access. Well, you could as part of the contract signed the beginning of the year get the parent put their name and their email could, address. But then someone has to manually enter that data as opposed to using our existing power mm -hmm. database, which we would hope would be a, a less cumbersome process moving forward. Um, my second point was just that, you know, these policies, the philosophy and beliefs policy was adopted in May of 2002. The uh, policy for evaluation of coaches was adopted in 2003. We're, you know, 10 years on for those. So it's obviously time to review and refresh those. And Jeff, I know we'll be glad to participate in those conversations as we move forward. Yeah, it's been great. And actually just having a few of these suggestions this evening is, has been really helpful. So to make that process as easy as possible. Yeah.
All right, one more. Uh, just quickly, um, Meredith, I hear what you're saying about the the cumbersome um, emails, but we do have boosters that have all those lists. So in the interim, I think that's a great solution mm -hmm. to send out. I mean, I would suggest that. And um, my, I, just, I don't mean to interrupt. My only concern is somehow it's got to be. I mean, boosters partially. Fund People need some to of our know community. that it's coming from me and not an individual. That's the only that it happened in the past, and um, it really it happened at a point in the season where the students were in playoffs, and it really caused a huge um, issue for students for the coaches. It was. I remember that. That would work, I think, if there was a way that they could say this message is from Jeff Thorak. Um, it's a reminder. I mean, I've Without gotten reminders from boosters about yeah. that, and, and it's worked, but I've, I've yeah. recognized that, that. I was looking back at my data, and <laughs> I was getting a lot of responses um, when I did it that way, when I would send it out to the boosters. I was just, it, it really made for a difficult situation once we experienced that. Right, somebody stepped out of it, yeah. Yeah, so oh. it, I like, I think it's a great way, and, and if, if we can do it where it's just At forward, the end of the season. Forward, and that's it, not commentary. I think that would be great. Right, mm -hmm. right. I think that makes sense. And I just also want to just thank you for all of the time that you spend. I see your car in that parking lot every weekend, and you must you must have an apartment there because <laughs> you spend more time in that high school and I um, I think it makes a difference I think you build a lot of trust with the kids and and I see you at every sporting event that I'm at and just I appreciate your dedication to um, athletics and and making the program so strong so thank you I really appreciate that I lo you know, love this community I cherish the school and the students and uh, parents and our administration that's really important part of my life. Well, thank you. Thanks for what you do. Thank you, Jeff. Thank, thank you, you very much for your time. Go Capers. <laughs> Go Capers. <laughs> so now we're looping back, right, to uh, communications item B, school safety. So, uh, I will invite um, our school administrators who are here to jump in at any point if there are things they want to add. But um, certainly school safety um, was brought sharply into focus um, last month with the um, tragedy that occurred in Newtown, Connecticut. And I think it raised a lot of anxiety, obviously, for parents not only in our community but across the country. Um, you know, I can tell you that we have an emergency management team at the district level that meets on a monthly basis. That team includes our police chief, Neil Williams, and um, our school liaison officer, uh, Mark Dorval. It also includes our fire chief, Peter Gleason, um, as well as uh, administrators from each building, and uh, Greg Marles and Russell Packett from Community Services, sometimes Jane Golding, depending on um, the nature of the conversation. Um, this year, our initial focus, because we had several new administrators, including um, Kelly, who was a new building administrator at Pond Cove, and Doug new to his role um, at the middle school, was on the drill schedule. Um, so making sure that our routines and practices were in place, fire drills um, that took place in the early fall, as those are the most common um, type of safety incident, incident that occur in schools, as well as a lockdown drill that took place in November. Um, we shared that information with parents in advance. Um, we also, as a committee, are looking at um, areas of, that we feel may present security concerns or that may be um, communications needs as part of, as part of our work. Um, one of the pieces that came up for us um, early this year was a need to look at communication within, uh, within and across schools. So one of the pieces that we um, have priced out is looking at um, handheld radios. Um, you know, those are something that are utilized in many schools. They're utilized by police and fire departments. Um, there's something that a number of us have experience with, but this district didn't have um, current um, equipment in place that, that could meet the needs of a campus our size. Um, another area that we've looked at is controlled access to our main entrances. Um, we had um, 
looked at some options for how to do that um, and had some of that information um, right around Thanksgiving when we learned that we would be facing a curtailment. Um, so that until we had the final curtailment numbers um, during the December break, that was something that was kind of on hold. So we actually, a um, group of us met today, walked through kind of looking at um, those options again. And our, our hope is that we can accomplish that in spite of the curtailment. We feel comfortable that we can move, move that project forward um, and have that work completed by the end of February break. Um, in essence, each main entrance to each school would be locked um, through the course of the day um, once students were in school with access controlled by a buzzer um, that, that um, rings into the main office. So, um, you know, that's one piece that's in place in schools across our country. Um, you know, it, it certainly doesn't prevent the type of incident that occurred in Newtown from occurring, um, but I think it is a preventative measure that um, certainly our emergency management team, including um, Chief Chief Williams feels is, is an appropriate step forward. So I don't know if there are questions. I mean, as we move closer to that date, obviously there'll be additional communication to parents um, on a school by school basis that just explains that approach and communication with students. I mean, I think the, the largest part of our work around school safety is generally educating um, students about how to keep themselves safe, educating the parent community about how we keep our children safe and you know, working internally in schools um, to, to do our best to keep the student body safe by doing things like conducting drills. I don't know if there are questions. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned obviously, uh, you know, uh, luxury we've had is we've had a, kind of an open door policy and it's appreciative, but obviously we have to balance, you know, our role to, secure the, the safety of the students. So maybe on the, you know, the fact on the controlled access, I know you're, have um, maybe just share a little bit um, as part of maybe educating uh, the community on w what that might look at like. And, um, you know, given, um, you know, there's open access, you can go, go into the, the lunchroom um, and such and so when you maybe just a little bit more details. If, you actually haven't been able to get into the lunchroom for a few right. weeks. <laughs> um, but, but typically whenever anyone is a visitor to the school, they're asked to sign in. What, what will occur, we hope, after February break, and again, the timing um, is not 100% certain at this point, is that uh, basically as you enter the high school, for example, there's a main door, and then there's that little vestibule area with a secondary set of doors. The secondary set of doors would be locked, um, monitored by um, staff in the main office via a camera and you would press a button to be um, entered into the building and if they did couldn't identify you or had a con reason to be concerned they could choose not to allow you in but they could also speak to you via an intercom um, and so that would be in place at each school should I use the mic I've never yeah. asked a question before um, I know that there a bunch of different entrances in our school will those not be locked because there's one on the side that, um, that's near the main entrance but like just there's a path leading to it will that just be unlocked and uh, unfortunately probably not um, you know that's a that's a communication that that will occur you know again as I said there'll be specific school based communication that occurs as we move forward and I realize that's a shift in practice for the high school in particular and I think you're talking about the doors to the senior parking yeah. area <laughs> that's the um, one I'm <laughs> talking about you know there um, and you know that's something we'll discuss in fact my um, when I my conversation with Mr. Henninger was you know I'm happy to come have the conversation with the senior class about um, the specific concerns, but most likely that door would also be locked, and that's the recommendation of um, the emergency management committee. And what about the? Will, will all the doors that students use be locked, and with with the buzzer system? The only doors that would have a buzzer system would be the main entrance and the what we call the service entrance. Other doors would remain locked. So we wouldn't be able to get in any of the other doors. Just that's correct clarification. And run with this. Be in effect sorry it's already in effect I tried to get in several doors couldn't get in so this year That's yes later this year 
Nolan, did you want to? Do you want to? She, she asked. I was. I was just wondering when it would. Okay. Okay. Can I ask a question, Meredith? Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm sure your team's already raised this, but there's, there's some self-evident questions. I know that the doors are all locked because I used to having work, you have a problem of the gym and the pool, which are used by the public as well as students. Mm -hmm. There's open campus, so you're going to have a lot of foot traffic starting at seven, eight, nine. Then kids live study. It's I assume it's going to be a fairly time-consuming, labor-intensive thing for a while given the open campus. And I'd also suggest that if you're going to lock the doors for safety, you want to make sure that those, that those doors will have to change the doors because you could shoot one of those doors and it'll shatter. Uh, and uh, again, I mean, uh, bulletproof glass isn't something that's in our budget because you would be looking at outfitting the entire school that way because most of our schools ac across the campus have the first floor access. Right, I mean, but they're all, almost all of them are metal doors. I'm talking about the front doors to the building. If, if you can have a camera there, you're not going to let them in unless you buzz it. You've got to make sure that they can't get in. And again, I mean, I, I don't think that our committee has felt that, you know, schools are never going to be 100% secure. I think the idea is that there are ways to sort of mitigate, um, ac to limit access and to help control that access, but we're we're not going to prevent someone with arm with um, a weapon and intent to injure someone from gaining access to our school. Perhaps they wouldn't get through the front door if we were to fix the front door, but there would be another way in if someone were determined to find it. I, I hear your point, David, loud and clear, and it's something we've discussed. No, I, I assume it was, but mo just whatever it's worth, most of the doors are a metal, and they have a small glass window in the high school anyways. I know. And the easiest access in terms of getting through a door is the front door. And I think it's a good idea to have a camera and a buzzer, but it's labor intensive. We have all this movement of students. And I'm just, I'm sure people have thought of it, but it, it doesn't do much good if you, somebody doesn't need to be buzzed in to be able to get in. That's all I'm suggesting. Abby. Um, so at the beginning of school, we all come in via buzzer or? No, the doors will be open for a period of time and will be locked at a given time. Okay. And then will they be unlocked at the end of school? <laughs> yes. Okay. You, you can always you can get out. out. You, you can get out, Abby. <laughs> they will let Not you out. You. Abby, the doors, no the doors will, will open from the, out, from the inside out. Okay. All the doors that open from the inside out now will continue to open. You have to do that for fire safety reasons. You can't lock. We're not locking kids in. Yeah. We're locking outsiders out. Okay. So, so a senior leaving from the door that goes out to the senior parking lot can go out that door. We just have to come back in. And they just have to come back in through the front door. Uh-oh. Parents might want to try this at home. Except <laughs> <laughs> so then it's reverse. You don't want to let them out. Right. <laughs> or you don't want them in. I don't know where. But Abby had a good question, and that is after the release of school at the last bell, mm -hmm. Will those doors then be unlocked for extracurriculars to that come and go through the building? That's a tough one. Certain parts of the building will be accessible and certain parts may not. It really is going to depend on the use of okay. the facilities, and that's a conversation our committee is still working through. Okay. Pieces of that. By the way, I did get carded as I went in the front door the other day to go use the gym, and I thought she, she scared the heck out of me. She only came up to my shoulders, but I did what she wanted. <clears throat> Thank you for that. And again, I mean, I. I you know, I think in the scheme of things, I appreciate that, and you know, I think we all want our students to be safe. And while you may be recognized, if someone else is filling in the office, they might not recognize I, you. I had no problem with it whatsoever. I thought it was amusing, but appropriate. Elizabeth? Uh, I understand and feel like even before any events happened that the kind of connection between the middle school and Pond Cove and the cafeteria itself has been kind of problematic anyway. Um, I'm curious how that's kind of being dealt with um, on a safety side, but also on a um, access side as far as um, silly, very little things like I typically bring lunch to my daughter on her birthday. 
and I've been taking my son on Thursdays to practice eating lunch in the cafeteria, and we can't get in anymore because he has you more. You can, in. but you would need to sign in at the office. I, I do every time, but I still can't get in. I, I would say you would need to contact the administrator. Okay, because we I will sign in, but last time we just ate in the lobby. It was okay. Yeah, I mean I don't I think like, you know just the intent access. isn't to exclude our our parents and volunteers from the building at all, and and I think if, if that's you know if people can make that clear the purpose of their visit, we're happy to help people find their way to where oh, where they're intended to be. I, I think a it's a, a great solution that you've come up with actually because you know my house myself and my husband have just walked into the middle school cafeteria in the middle of the day sat down and had a rolling conversation with the kids not one teacher approached not one administrator asked and so you know i think we're safe but i can say that i had an opposite i met mr Purley on my second lunch <laughs> with my son and i met I, the first time we ate there i had a teacher come and speak with me which i really appreciated so I had the opposite experience. But Interesting. I really, I mean, the first day we were taking Abigail in, I kind of went, this is tricky here, that whole open access space. And I understand, you know, I have, I liked the convenience sort of, but on the other side it was a little, a little, yeah, it was a little concerning. In the long run it will probably feel slightly less convenient, but we hope it won't feel less mm -hmm. welcoming because we certainly, you know, value having parents and volunteers in our schools. Any other questions? I have a quick question, and it's a broad question for you, Meredith. Mm -hmm. um, are there any high schools, I'm thinking of high schools in particular because the kids are a little older and could be responsible for this, that um, institute a badge system so kids could, you know, I know my son in his dorm um, in college, you know, they just put their, their badge up and the door opens. Is that something that public The answer is yes. It's something we've talked about. Sense. Typically it's something that's employed by larger schools. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, we, we have the ability as, as, a, uh, as a school system to basically know all of our students. Mm -hmm. um, schools that don't, that's more common. Typically schools that are two, three, four times our size. Um, sometimes larger. Um, the price per student is roughly $5. However, that doesn't mean that someone isn't going to lose their badge or leave it behind somewhere else. And I think there is, it's something that we certainly can discuss further. And I, I hope that you know, when Mr. Henninger or I or Mr. Shedd meet with students that we'll have some conversations about um, topics like that. Mm -hmm. But they would need to have sort of limited you know, access opportunity, the cards themselves, you know, would be, maybe would allow access at a given door, but the concern would be if you lose yours or it gets left behind on a playing field somewhere else or in a supermarket parking lot, and we don't find out about that right away, whoever now is in possession of that card that says on it very clearly, Cape Elizabeth High School, now is the opportunity to gain access to our building through whatever doors have that access. So that's the the risk, but, uh, but it's something we certainly had, have had some preliminary conversations about. The right. problem with that, Mary, is that sometimes it's the student themselves that, that's the person you don't want into the building. If you look at some of the incidences around this country. Right. Well, what, the, one of the, the difficult task of the emergency management team, and I appreciate the work you've, you've done on it, is, is balancing convenience and a welcoming atmosphere, but also, um, okay. you know, the, the, the the many different and various threats that schools face. And, and so well, we have one particular kind of incident all on our minds. You know, there are other incidents that, you know, that, that are cause for, um, for a review of what our policies are, and I appreciate the work you've done. And are more common. And are, and are probably more common, right. Mayor, one final. Um, given the proximity of the police station and uh, the video, uh, is this something where the police officers at the police station could, would also be able to view the, wherever the, I guess the cameras are as a additional? There is a potential for that. It would require a different sort of camera system than has um, initially been proposed. The initial thought really is that that's locally monitored within each office. Um, it, it would be a different cost point and I, it's not something that 
um, has been recommended at this point by the chief, but I'm happy to raise that question at our next meeting. Yeah, I mean, if just the incremental cost may be, be you know, justify the. I just have a quick question. Um, you mentioned that you were meeting with students about it to talk about I it. I mentioned that I offered that. Can <laughs> all right. Well, if you do that, can you let me know, and I'll I can organize a group of students because I'm sure they have a lot of opinions about it. I don't, I'm sure that's true. Okay. Thanks. I think Abby will have a new parking location very soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now that we're all charged up, we'll move right into um, number letter D and the NCLB reports. So included in your packet um, were the extensive um, No Child Left Behind. Excuse me, um, John, I'm so sorry. I just um, saw Jen is here, um, and she's here for project graduation, which I think is a short um, topic. And I, I don't know if it's appropriate for me to interrupt. I'm sorry, but I should have That's done it way. earlier. Okay. I know she has uh, to teach tomorrow. And <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that, Kate. Thank you. Um, let's let's do that. Let's move to. Um, 6B, consideration to approve the class of 2013 Project Graduation Committee fundraising efforts. May I have a motion? I move that we um, approve the proposed class of 2013 Project Graduation trip on June 9th, 2013, according to board policy IHOA. You just gave C. You just gave Sorry. C. He said yeah. B. Did you say B? <coughs> I said we should G. consider them together. Should we consider them together? I move that we consider both B and C on our agenda. I've already read C. I'll read B, consideration to approve the class of 2013 Project Graduation Committee fundraising efforts according to board policy DFR fundraising. Is there a second? Is that for two motions or one? It's a mo one motion one containing motion both, both. Okay. items. Do we want, it seems like they're two kind of separate items, but I mean, I'm, as the parliamentarian, are you all right? <laughs> you, you can. Uh, I mean, I th you can do both, or you can them. do them. It's, a, it's okay. really the board. Okay, I'll so second. we can. All right, we have a second. I'll second. Any discussion of either? Of the, so the first is the, the first is the fundraising, and the second is the trip. Yeah. comment briefly. Okay. So the policy requires that fundraising requests for over $20,000 be approved by the board. Right now their target is roughly $19,000, but to err on the side of caution, we felt it would be prudent to um, bring this before the board for approval. On the second item, um, graduation, project graduation trip details are generally not included in the board packet because that information is typically kept confidential up to um, the date of the project graduation trip. Mr. Shedd has reviewed that information um, and, and we are comfortable that, that it meets our policy requirements. Okay, any questions oh. or discussion? I, I would just say that um, it's a labor of love for the people who organize this and to give the senior class a, uh, a chance to be together one last time before they go off. And I think the kids work really hard and um, I, always been um, I've always gotten good feed great feedback from last classes um, who have done this and the kids who just had a great time nice. being together as a to do with um, yeah. as a group and so mm -hmm. thank you for doing the work so that's it. thank you Kate I'll second that too <laughs> all in favor thank okay. you John Thank you. You can stay for No Child Left Behind, or you Are you sure? <laughs> really? Or you can leave us behind. We have handouts. <laughs> we'll be some boards left behind. So back to 5D, the No Child Left Behind reports. So thank you. Um, returning to the large packet for all of the district data, I would direct you Six pages from the back. Unfortunately, these are not page numbered. 
but the top of the page says accountability data um, for the elementary school. Is that the accountability data? Yes, it is. And the first page is um, elementary level. So first I will say, based on 2011-12 assessment results, all of our schools made adequate yearly progress. Um, what is useful, I think, to look at in the accountability data are the proficiency levels um, of our students compared to the state targets, and then to look at the subgroup data that exists for our students. So if you look at um, the accountability data for elementary school, you'll see in the top row all students in the second uh, well, third and fourth columns technically, 85% of our students met or exceeded the target for proficiency um, in reading, whereas 70% of the students in the state met the target for reading. And further across, you'll see the 84%. Can you wait one sorry, second? No, we're, yeah, uh, I'm sorry. We have, we're have, we're in. We have like four handouts here. So it's the one labeled <laughs> The one that says district. Paper was Where in the school the department, so it should be the it should have right four. So it's the largest of them. Right here. <coughs> Summary okay. data. Okay. And then it's. And then it's the third. six from the back. Six yeah, from you the have back. Yeah, both sides. Oh. So it's three from the back. <laughs> <laughs> I was on that page, but I'm not looking at the same numbers. It's okay. Elementary, the top of yours. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Elementary. Okay. So look in the third and fourth. Okay. Okay. So once you've found the page that says accountability data for elementary, you scan across the all students. The first set just tells what percent of our students were tested versus what percentage of students across the state were tested. You see that the target is 95% up above and 100% of our students were tested. The next area under reading shows you that 85% of our students met or exceeded the target, state target being 75%, whereas only 70% of the students statewide met or exceeded the target. Move across to mathematics, percent of students tested remains the same you'll see 84% of our students met or exceeded the target versus 65% of the students across the state. Further down, you'll see that we really only have one subgroup reported, um, which is our students with disabilities subgroup. And this is data that we um, looked at last year. Obviously, this, these assessments are conducted in October, so to expect that there are going to be significant changes from the data that we looked at last spring and October is it's relatively unlikely. But, but again, what you see is 85% of all of our students met or exceeded the target versus 42% of our students with disabilities. Again, that, that gap is fairly consistent with the data across the state, but that remains an area of concern. And those are, it's those subgroup issues that No Child Left Behind was really designed to address. They want to make sure that all students are meeting proficiency targets, whether you have a disability, whether you're a native speaker of another language, whether you belong to an economically disadvantaged subgroup. So the next page shows Is you. Is the target the same for a kid with a disability? I mean, it seems self evident. Is the same target for a kid with a disability as one of. Yes. That's. So, Fun. that's right. <laughs> it is the same target. Interesting. Um, the next page, if you turn it over, is middle school students. And again, if you look at, top, uh, look at the top column, top row, sorry, for all students, 100% of our students were tested versus 99 across the state. 92% of our middle school students met or exceeded the reading targets versus 73% for the state. 87% of our students met or exceeded the target in mathematics versus 62% for the state. And then you see two subgroups reported down below. Um, 
and you see the note at the bottom, subgroups require that there be 20 or more students in a group. So if there are fewer than 20 students that meet the criteria, those results are not reported. Our economically disadvantaged subgroup is one that should stand out to us, I think, as a concern in that 59% of our economically disadvantaged students at the middle school met reading targets versus 62% of the students across the state in that same subgroup. Um, and then mathematics, 59% of that group met mathematics targets the same number, but versus 48% of those students across the state. I'm, I'm curious. Um, I, can, I can grasp why a student with a disability would have trouble meeting the target of a student without a disability. I'm, I'm kind of stunned that an economically disadvantaged kid in Cape attending the same type of education system as every other kid were not meeting the targets. I would love to enter into that conversation, and Kelly will be right behind me, I'm sure. But um, what, what we know from the research, so not just our local information, but what we know um, is that students who come from economically disadvantaged backgrounds often have been read to less, have had less exposure to print material and books, um, and often start school with a vocabulary one-fourth or less the size of many of their peers. And so the gains for those students um, often are smaller. It's the reason programs like Title I were created to address some of those inequities. I, I can understand that, but I also look at comparison to the state. If you're not an economically disadvantaged white kid in Cape, we substantially exceed the state. But when it's economically disadvantaged kid, we're the less in the state or better, but not substantially better. And I, I don't disagree with that. I think we can be doing better by that population of students. And, and one of our challenges as a district is to look carefully. You see the data reported for the cluster of 20 students, but we can look as administrators at the results for those individual students and, and find patterns in their performance and address concerns as they arise. Can I ask a question, or do you want to continue? Go ahead. Um, how do we know that this is, a, is it from the hot lunch program or is, do, how do we know that these students are from a dis um, economically disadvantaged? The yes. socioeconomic, um, economically disadvantaged subgroup determination is based on free and reduced lunch information. Okay. Economically no, it's not that we don't have to So I'll just flip to the last page, which is the high school. Um, again, you can see that 83% of our high school students met or exceeded the state target um, of 78% with, versus 48% of our students across the state. 81% of our students met or exceeded the state target for mathematics versus 48% of students across the state. Um, and again, you'll see for our students with disabilities, um, that there remains a gap between their performance and the performance of their like peers. As David said, they're measured against the same standards. Their performance is expected to be against the same standards. 38% um, of our students with disabilities met reading targets versus 17% statewide. And 31% of our students met the mathematics targets versus 15% statewide. So. There's lots of other information and trend data included in these reports. I, but I think, again, for me, for us, for me, the things that stand out are to focus in on that economically disadvantaged subgroup. Um, I think we have the resources within our district to help those students um, overcome um, whatever challenges they may end or, enter school with or whatever skill gap may exist for them as they enter our school system, um, but also to continue our focus on looking at the performance of students with disabilities and whether or not we are um, helping them to make growth. And there's, all, there's skill gap and then there's also um, safety and hunger, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, or do we have the resources and ability to address those sort of issues as well? Again, the reports for these students are students who are receiving free and reduced lunch. Um, you know, certainly that program continues breakfast. to exist. Um, you know, I, I, we have school social workers who are um, involved and guidance counselors and classroom teachers who are involved in addressing those needs when they're identified. So yes, I feel comfortable that we can address most of those needs. Safety, 
um, you know, home-based safety concerns. You know, we certainly can you know, do what we can to provide a consistent, safe environment for students, and you know, we have obligations to report um, concerns that fall into the category of child abuse or neglect. Um, but we can't mitigate every um, unsafe situation that's occurring in a household, and we may not always know. But we do our best, certainly, I think, to put those social work and counseling um, supports in place for students who appear to need them. Mayor, uh, no child left behind. Is there an expiration date on this federal uh, mandate or maybe just a little bit of an overview of um, how meaningful do we find this data? And um, I know at some point, you know, there's all sorts of data, kneecaps, and uh, maybe at a future board uh, we could discuss, you know, what what data we find most relevant to improving student learning. Mm -hmm. So so the No Child Left Behind report card, first of all, No Child Left Behind was authorized originally in 2001. Um, <laughs> pieces of it have been um, reactivated and supported. I, I would say <coughs> the jury is still out on how this will move forward. Um, certainly, I think there will continue to be accountability requirements for schools as we move into the Common Core assessment and out of the NECAP assessment um, that, that we're currently using. There obviously will be a period of time where asking all schools to meet the 100% proficiency targets doesn't happen. Most um, states have requested waivers from the No Child Left Behind targets. Originally, those targets said that all schools would meet 100% of students um, in all schools would meet proficiency, <coughs> would be proficient by 2013, um, 2014. So uh, clearly that has not occurred um, in Maine, nor not in Maine, nor in any other state. Um, and so right now we have a, a sea of waivers um, that are sitting in, um, in Federal Department of Education um, and being ruled on one at a time. but. Uh, so I think the way that, and this may be somewhat cynical, but I think one of the ways that, that we've addressed that is to say, well, let's use a different assessment so that we have an opportunity to sort of establish a baseline and, and then look at performance as we move forward. Kate. I wanted to ask Meredith about, um, I know we keep data um, on the kid, on students' performance um, and that we, we have a great person who crunches the numbers. I can't remember his name, but... Dean Harris. Yes, um, and I've heard about him before and his amazing work. Are you surprised about these numbers? Um, I know that you must look at the data and that administrators look at the data and that they, we do have a, a new administration. Um, so this is new information you're looking at, new, tra you know. Uh, were you, I, so you said you weren't surprised. I mean, this, this data for this year is fairly consistent with the data that we saw last year, but, but we're again, you know, we got last year's um, AYP reports, I think, in April. Um, and this was just issued a couple months ago, or last month, the end of last month, um, from an assessment that we, you know, completed in October. So are we surprised by the data? No. Um, is it something that we are monitoring and already taking steps to address? I would say yes. I think that was part of the reason that you saw the RTI executive function position, for example, at the middle school. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's why you saw some of the changes that you saw recommended in instructional support. Definitely we've been aware of some of these concerns, uh, specifically for the two subgroups that we've talked about tonight, economically disadvantaged and students with disabilities. Um, and you know there, there continues to be work to be done there, but I think we're moving in the right direction. Great. Can I ask just one yes. question? And um, uh, Meredith, I just briefly went over these, and, and the one thing that jumped out at me, and, and maybe it's not of concern to you, is in the early grades there seemed to be quite a delta between math and reading and girls and boys. The girls outperform the boys quite a bit in the reading and the boys outperform the girls. Mm -hmm. um, is that 
something that we usually see? Is that something that we're looking at trying to, to bridge that? We looked at those trends um, pretty closely last year. Mm -hmm. um, and really, this, the gap was most noticeable at the high school level last mm -hmm. year. So the fact that it stands out at the elementary level, it hasn't been a trend. So it may be the current composition of the class. Right. Um, you know, the classes that were assessed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know if it was a... It's something we did. Those gender pieces are something we definitely it. monitor right. um, for exactly those reasons. I mean, there is research that, that says, you know, if, if young women don't have, um, you know, models of females who are comfortable with mathematics, that they may not see themselves as capable mathematicians. Um, so those, and, and the opposite is true to some extent with, with boys, um, not necessarily that they need models of good male readers, but that their interest in reading may not always be a match for what we're offering them for reading selections in school. Um, so those are definitely things we monitor and, and I think try to address within classrooms. Yeah. I guess I want to give you a pat on the back for the hiring committees I've sat in. I know you take this information into account when you go through resumes and decide on hiring committees. And um, there's so much to the jobs that uh, administration, superintendent and administration do to provide the best teachers for kids um, so that it can get to every child. And I thank you for continuing that work because obviously there's more we can do. But um, you know, I just recognize that you do look at that detail. Um, so appreciate it. Yeah, and I again, I would say our administrators, you know, all, do a nice job of sharing this information with their teams and taking the information seriously. And you know, and and I think back, you know, to a degree to Michael's question, it's not the only data we look at. You know, one assessment is not the end-all be-all in terms of helping us look at the needs um, of an individual student, but it does, this kind of data does help us look at our schools as a whole and to help us see, you know, are, are we um, making the kinds of progress that we would expect to make based on the instruction that we're delivering in our schools. Thank you, Mary. So we will see no more questions. We'll move on to um, the item E, proposed budget meeting. In your packet? Where? It should be a draft budget calendar. Oh, we got them. I'll give you mine. This schedule roughly follows last year's calendar with the dates changed. Um, and so it's really just out as a draft for discussion and I think for board members to identify conflicts or concerns and to provide that feedback so that we can finalize a calendar, um, ideally by the workshop meeting at the end of the month. So people should just take a look at this and compare it to their calendar and let us know if you have serious conflicts. Can I ask an overall question, an overarching question? Um, is that all right, John? Sure. Um, I see that the budget vote is in June, and generally on off election, years that are not election years, we've tried to move that up until May to give the school system some flexibility um, in terms of if the budget doesn't make it. Um, so I'm wondering, was that a decision I, I meant to look that up today, and I'm sorry I didn't, but it, okay, I'm looking to Pauline to see if she can add any insight to that question, because I can't. <laughs> that 
Right. And two years before, I think it had been in May. Um, and so I, I know that it, it, it made sense to me to, when we could do it in May, to do it in May in case there was, a, you know, in case the, the budget doesn't um, uh, get an affirmative vote and that gives us a little more flexibility in time. I, I, I would also echo that because it's not only what gives us time, but quite frankly, you have more people who will vote in May than you will have in June, and even less people that will vote in July than you do in June. It's, it becomes less representative democracy. Uh, the later, later in the summer, we or early to mid to late summer, we push it off. So, is it a standalone item on the ballot? In usually, would it be this year? In off years, it usually I'm, is. Is there anything else? Any other? Do you know? Any sort of election? Okay, so I will um, I will speak with Mr. McGovern about that yeah. date. Okay, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. uh, looking around, I think it's a, at least the people who have, it's a strong consensus of this board. The earlier, the better. Mm -hmm. Is it? Uh, just looking at the faces. Yeah. That's why they stick near the end. Well, the, the, the experience that we've had is had to in do the, it in July and, in, or August. And it was poor. July well, and August. July and August. And that, that's the experience July that we had. July and August. It was we had to do it. So Turnout was. Or actually, September, June, July. I think September, right? Wow. So we had three one year. Two. I mean, you just don't know. I mean, it's it's better to be safe. I think if we have that opportunity to do it earlier, that would be my preference. Okay, thank you for that but reminder. But if it costs the town thank more, you, if there's already an election, um, then I, you know it's fine to do it in June. But if it's a standalone election, I would actually even make it stronger since probably 80. I'm not sure what about town budget is the school, but around 80 percent. It seems that that should be the most important vote, as opposed to something else on the ballot, mm -hmm. unless it's a national election or. That's what I'm saying. Is that yeah. there's a state referendum? I don't know. If there's anything coming up. Thank you, Mary. Mm -hmm. um, is there are there any um, you know uh, programmatic changes that uh, would be beneficial to have a uh, you know um, seek public input outside of a budget workshop um, that's considered, or uh, I shouldn't phrase it, if, if you think there are uh, any potential major programmatic changes that it would be uh, helpful to have that discussion with the public outside of the budget workshop, um, is there enough flexibility or? I, mean, I, I think there's certainly ample time. I mean, I, I think it's a, it's a dual-edged sword in that, you know, we present a budget to the board, and pending the board's receipt, we may or may not want to have a public conversation about programmatic changes. I mean, there, I mean I'm not suggesting that there are huge programmatic changes moving forward, but I think it's not our place to initiate a conversation with the public before the board has said it approves of those things moving forward. So, yes, in that time period, if if the board is interested in moving something forward and wants to, you know, directs us to have further conversation, I think certainly there is adequate time to do that. And do you think given we do uh, a three-year budget and uh, given our recent meeting on the capital improvements um, effort, uh, is that something we, you think we have time to complete before that? Um, or I think we'll certainly be able to draft a, a five to ten year plan. I think it's something that will be revisited on an annual basis, but I think we'll certainly have, be able, we as an administrative team will share our best thinking with the board. There will be a board um, facilities planning committee um, meeting to look at an initial draft. Um, and I, I, yes, I think that fits the budget cycle as well. And I would even, you know, given it might be a longer, than three years with what we provided. I think I agree that we could do both and even if we couldn't finish the, the five or multi-year plan. Okay, anything else on the budget schedule? <laughs> okay, then on to 
F, the superintendent's report. Okay. Let's see. I'll start off. Um, there will be in, uh, there are interim assistant principals uh, interviews for the middle school scheduled for later on this week. So um, we may have more information to share with you um, either at the workshop later in the month or at the February business meeting. Uh, we have been fortunate um, to receive a district grant from CEF to have a community literacy festival during the week of May 6th. So we are um, in the early planning stages for that week, but if you're listening or if you're sitting here and you have ideas um, or connections to authors, poets, playwrights, graphic novelists, you name it, um, please email um, me or, or our office and um, someone from our committee will follow up with you. But it's a very exciting opportunity and um, we're looking forward to a celebration of literacy in our community. On the professional development end, our literacy book groups met uh, yesterday, Monday, with a focus on comparing and, comparing and contrasting information within and across texts, um, with a continued focus on providing evidence from the text to support point of view, as we discussed. Um, that's one of the big push pushes that we see in the Common Core um, standards in um, the literacy on the literacy front, and we are finalizing details of a local <coughs> professional development um, Dine and Discuss series for our teachers on literacy. Um, later this month, we'll be bringing um, teacher author Penny Kittle um, for an evening session with um, interested teachers, and Linda Reef will be coming also within the next month. Penny's more of a high school um, adolescent literacy person, Linda more of a middle school literacy person, and we're hoping to bring Ralph Fletcher, who um, actually talks a lot about gender differences in um, writing in particular, and has written a book called Guys Write and a number of others. So that's an exciting PD um, piece for us. Um, let's see. I'll be having a coffee chat on Saturday, the 26th of January, <coughs> from 9 to 10 at the town hall. I can't promise that my coffee is any better, <laughs> um, but the conversation is always worthwhile. So. I look forward to that uh, meeting, and um, you know I know it's not um, news to the community that there was a well-publicized incident that took place at our high school um, last month. It's not something that we um, were able to discuss at a board um, level at that point. It was an issue still under investigation. Um, I think it's it's difficult when something receives that much public attention for community members for. Um, administrators for school board members um, in that we don't have the ability to talk openly um, or as openly as people might wish about some of those issues. Um, part of our responsibility is to protect, protect student confidentiality as you know as we would do for any child and um, sometimes incidents make the papers and sometimes they don't but our responsibility to student privacy remains the same. Um, and you know, I appreciate how difficult that is, and I know you know there are lots of members of this community who have questions. Um, I, you know, I certainly would invite them to contact me. I'm happy to talk about policy and to talk about um, you know sort of the broad response. I know the board has asked um, the administrative team for a presentation um, on the topic of substance abuse and our policies around substance abuse, and that um, right now I believe is planned for the February meeting or. Um, whenever board leadership um, asks for that to be on, ge on an agenda. Um, you know, certainly it's not, um, while on occasion, sometimes things make the papers, as, as occurred in this incident, substance abuse is not um, an issue that's unique to this community. It's not an issue that's new for this community. Um, our middle and high school administrators gave a presentation um, a week or two before the December 7th um, incident at a forum hosted by the HOPE group here in our community to talk about the issue of substance abuse. Um, you know, the, the data from our integrated youth health survey had been sent home to parents and, and communicated. Um, so while the scope of the incident was perhaps larger than um, you know, we're used to, I would say it's, it's an issue that um, is not something that's new to this community, uh, nor to any community, and it's a serious one. You know, it has serious implications for kids. 
um, and for our school as a whole. And it's an issue that you know faculty are um, discussing, and that you know students will have the opportunity to discuss with faculty. Um, and you know we're. I appreciate people's frustration with the fact that we're not able to share details, but that's our job too, um, as it would be if it were any one of your children um, facing any sort of disciplinary issue. So. Curtailment is the last great news that we received in December. Um, we uh, heard from the state that we'd be losing about $196,000, just, just under 10% of our state revenues this year. We are um, feeling like we'll be able to get through the year without um, significant impact on student programming at this point. Um, but but I, I think it's fair to say we'll be walking a fairly fine line for the remainder of the year. Um, the larger concern from my perspective is what happens um, if there are additional um, cuts this year proposed, as we may hear through a supplemental budget when it's introduced um, within the next couple of weeks, and um, more significantly as well, the budget for the next biennium. I think it's reasonable for us to conclude that state funding is not going to increase and will likely further decrease. Um, the state will be receiving a report, I believe, in March, um, reviewing the EPS formula. Whether or not the legislature will decide to make changes, I can't say. Um, but uh, even if they do, I'm not convinced that CAPE will um, have a favorable outcome in adjustments that may be made to the EPS formula. So, um, you know, locally, we've just begun work on the budget. You know, for this year, we're able to um, look at some of the contingency funds that are in our budget. We had some um, savings um, projected in heat because we were able to lock in at a lower fuel price than we projected. Our health care costs um, came in at a lower rate been projected as well. So again, we'll be able to walk that line, I think, during um, this year, but we'll be having to look really carefully as we move forward. And I don't know, um, we don't really have any information at this point about when we may receive state um, revenue numbers for the next year, fiscal year. Um, you know, I, it's been as late as April, I think, Pauline. Um, in the past, so that makes budgeting a challenge. Right now, as we look at our budget, our job, I think, as an administrative team is to say, here's what we think our students need, and to advocate for that, and um, you know, we'll continue to make those adjustments as we move forward. That's it. David? Um, question, considering what's going on in Washington, uh, and within a couple of months of possible cuts, about the federal government. How much money, at least for the public, do we get either directly from the federal government or indirectly to the state and then to us? I mean, might we be affected what happens in Washington? Yeah, I think our largest, our largest aid comes through um, special education entitlement funds. We receive a s relatively small amount through Title I. Um, I think it's early to say whether or not special education will be cut. I think because the federal government has never really been able to fulfill the promise level of funding in that area, that will be one that will be harder for them to cut. I think we may see um, some reductions in, in our Title I funds as we move forward. Uh, but, but, but that's a still a risk. Share. Absolutely. Okay. I, again, I think the greatest reduction that we've seen is in the Medicaid um, reimbursement due to some changes that occurred there. Will we be dipping into that? Brilliantly conceived contingency fund. <laughs> it's just we may well. I was ask Mr. Hill. Oh, I <laughs> oh, knew that was coming. <laughs> I saw you looking at me from I the moment I you. said that. <laughs> Who ever thought of that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's unfortunate. I mean, typically, why districts <laughs> districts budget contingencies to deal with things like heating system breakdowns or um, you know unanticipated other unanticipated equipment failures. They typically districts don't really budget to deal with state. Um, the state basically you know, changing its mind well, about con funding. Considering this happened with relative frequency every year, it's probably not a contingency fund anymore. It should be yeah. a set amount. We automatically just deduct. It's a joke. <laughs> a containment line item. Joe. Containment line item, yeah. Uh, yeah just, just for um, our listeners and, and for my own education, what is the general percentage of our overall budget of that of our overall budget, budget, what percentage comes from state dollars? The state gives us about 2.2 .2 million of our 28 million 
I mean, I'm looking at Pauline again. She's ten percent. Ten percent. Yeah. Um, so it's it's a little under ten percent, and ten percent of that has been reduced. Okay. Thank you, John. Um, okay. Can I ask Meredith? And I. I'd like if anyone's watching, I know that the, um, the incident that was reported in the paper is very uh, upsetting for our community um, in, everyone's, in everyone's mind. HOPE is a group that's a parent-run group, but can you give the correct definition and tell about the meeting tomorrow, uh, Thursday night for anyone who would like to? I, I haven't actually seen the agenda for that meeting, so yeah. I'm not sure I'm the best person to speak to it. I don't know, Mr. Shedd, if you have. I know that Hope, um, Hope hosted a forum in November while you're coming up, hosted a forum in November to talk about, um, more specifically about alcohol and social hosting um, related issues. And I believe one of the items that they want to talk about is whether or not it might make sense to host another forum or do some education around marijuana use. Yeah, um, yeah we meet. Um this Thursday, 7 o'clock, in the high school library. Um, so it's open to the public. It'll be great to have. I'm pretty sure, um, well, there's always an update from Officer Dorval in terms of any legal issues, obviously without names attached to those things, just to get a sense of what's going on and an opportunity to ask questions. Um, I'm sure people will ask questions of me about the recent incident, and I will say what I can, but it will be fairly limited in terms of what I can say. I believe that at this meeting they've also invited um, somebody who's an expert on marijuana um, and its, it's damaging impact um, to speak as well. And I think they're hoping to arrange for that expert or somebody else on that topic to present to a wider audience at some point. The, uh, the event that we had in November focused mostly, not exclusively, but mostly on alcohol. <laughs> when this wider event includes students? Students are always invited to every HOPE event, and they would be more than welcome to come. Um, and there will definitely be discussions with students in the not too distant future uh, about sort of substance issues, which is something we're talking about as well. So. Thank you. Yep. Well, I guess I, I want to say this um, HOPE meeting isn't because of the incident, but it's ongoing work that happens monthly, right. and it happens to be at the high school library, um, and often experts are brought in um, for people to learn about the issues. Yeah, we, we meet every month, and really the whole mission of HOPE is, has been from the beginning for five or six years is to open up the communication in the issue in the community around issues of substance abuse. Uh, so they continue to do everything they can to try to get folks to talk about it because it's really important um, and it's not fully appreciated how present it is here as it is in many communities. But I think communities like this one have a particular struggle with talking about it. Thank you. Yep. Can I ask Jeff one more question? Sure. Um, <clears throat> Jeff. Um, Meredith, <laughs> Meredith mentioned um, a meeting where um, some data was released, some usage data. Yep. Is that online? Is that on your? Yes. Yep. Yeah, it's been online for. I yep. sent it out to all parents. Yep. Um, I know it was sent to us it's in, in November. I, and I yes. Think I'm quite sure you can still find it's it on, on the, the principal's, principal's website. Can you find it on your website? Yeah. Yes. Which I'm just is wondering. a little bit out of date right now because it says still says that TEDx is coming. <laughs> so I've got to get that updated. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm just thinking if anybody wants to yes. look at that, who's listening. It's on the principal's page, and I. I believe it, there may have been a press release related to it on the district page as well. I'm not but it is that. absolutely still accessible. Yep. Okay, good. Okay. Thank you. John, Thank you, Jack. Two quick points. Yes. One, um, when Meredith was talking about this incident, I just want to make it clear to the public, because I have received questions that people want to offer me information. It has to be clear, and, it's not, and this is not what a public generally understands. We cannot be involved in the factual gathering uh, of this, nor should we offer our opinions about it, because if, and, and it's still possible that some uh, or one of these students may come before us, in which case we have to remain, um, like a jury, we have to remain, in essence, sequestered 
which means we're supposed to not learn the facts and not read the newspaper. I mean, that's sort of farcical, but the reality is we're supposed to re remain in, impartial so we can render impartial judgment. So when people ask me or want to tell me things, I have to remind them, if you have a question or if you have a problem or if you have a fact, go to the superintendent, go to Jeff, go to anybody in the administration, but I am maybe a jury member. So I can't really listen to this. Um, people don't quite understand that. And the other point I wanted to make was this completely on the other end of the spectrum about the state kind of curtailment. It's about $200,000. Yes. Um, people should understand that, that if we're able to deal with that, it's not going to be easy. Uh, one year we had a 200 some odd thousand dollar hit due to some special education students moving in and we had to lay off staff. This is not something that's easy to do because we get our revenue fixed. Unlike most businesses, we can't raise our prices not until we have another budget passed. So when we get hit with unexpected expenses or unexpected losses in revenue, we don't have any way to make it up except um, uh, tightening our belts or whatever else we can do using contingency funds or whatever it is. It's not easy to do. And I, I just want to make people understand that that $200,000 is not a huge sum, but it's not an easy sum when you have a fixed revenue stream. Absolutely. Thank you, David. So we're going to move then um, to 6D. Consideration to approve Ted Jordan's AP government class trip to Washington, D.C., March 20 to 24th. May I have a motion? I move that we approve Ted Jordan's AP government class trip to Washington, D.C., March 20th through 24th, 2013. Second. Seconded. Thank you. Uh, any discussion? The only thing I'd I point out that what we're proving is what is described in the attachment to um, 6D. 6D, that's right. Six, is it, but it's described in detail in the attachment, and that's what we're approving. Okay. Rather than just simply a motion to approve a trip, we, we have detail, and we're approving the detail of that trip. That's right. Thank you, David. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Okay. Item seven, committee reports. Oh. Joe? Okay, so uh, the seasoned policy chair has held her first policy meeting um, yesterday morning. Um, we normally hold our policy meetings on the first Monday of the month so that we can have policies if there are any ready for our first reading on the second Tuesday. But because the first Monday comes before the second Tuesday this month. We don't have any um, to bring before you, but I would look for a big long list in February because we'll have what we reviewed yesterday as well as what we review for the first Monday in February. Um, and I just wanted to give a quick accounting. Um, I counted the policies. There are 242 policies within our district, give or take a handful. Um, and so far to date in our review of the policy manual, we have approved 47. And eliminated. And, deleted. and we deleted two. two. <laughs> and as you recall, our mission was to make it smaller. So we added one. And ironically, we, one. we did add one. And we also, the one we, we also updated one, um, the technology one, I think we tripled the size of it. So. Um, we're working on it. We have 193 policies to go, so there's a lot of room for improvement as far as concise. Uh, but what we have done is, um, to remind you, is we've reviewed the ones that were either required by law or in which the laws have been updated and changed since the last review of those policies. So we've gotten the bulk of the really solid hard work out of the way. The, the work that's ahead of us is more of the soft policies that have to do with our own district. and. Um, they'll come with their own set of challenges. So um, again, the uh, list of policies and our packets for our meetings will be posted on the website if there's anyone who's interested in finding out what policies are up for review and they have any input or interest. There'll be first readings um, at the school board meeting following. Thank you, Joe. Can I just briefly note, 50 Please. policies is a lot of work. <laughs> policies are not not quick 
you know, walk through decisions. They require a lot of labor intensive reading, um, a lot of work on the part of the policy committee in Absolutely. particular, the administrative team, Andrea Fuller in my office, who um, this is no small helps pull task. them all together, our policy consultant. But uh, yeah, 50 policies. It's about 300 about. pages at least. <laughs> Certainly. Yeah. Um, and, and I just want to commend the board on its attention to that task, which you laid out in a board goal. I mean, while you may feel you're only 20% of, of the way there. Uh, oh, well, I would also <laughs> like to commend you and Andrea for the amazing amount of work that goes into organizing, keeping us on track, and administering that whole piece of work, because it's no small task yourself, and, and above all of the other things that you also have to do. So thank you for that. And to all of you. Thank you. Mr. Finance Chair, you have a... Um, yes, we have a, a meeting. I can't, I don't have the agenda, but uh, I'd say the priority for the, uh, the workshop uh, on the finance side is if everyone could please uh, look at the budget calendar um, and get back to as soon as possible, because as you know, once we start, it, it moves uh, rather quickly. And in terms of a committee report, uh, the school board, um, I believe it was last week, met with the town council to discuss uh, capital improvements as uh, many citizens uh, requested um, was for the, uh, the town of Cape Elizabeth as one town to provide citizens with a, a longer term view of what our, our whole town's capital needs are and the school board um, through the building grounds committee, but also through the, the larger f uh, school board, f uh, as we all sit on the finance committee, will provide um, uh, in a, uh, a budget or a plan for capital improvements. As many of you know, we've already, uh, we annually we do a uh, capital improvements budget for the annual budget, but also we look at our budget needs over a five year um, duration um, so this is part of our recurring uh, process what we did learn at the meeting with the town council was there's also a desire and a recognition that given there's some debt retiring in a few years um, it would be advantageous for taxpayers given uh, low interest rates and spreading um, projects such as school roofs over uh, many years given it's a long lived assets of 25 years so we were excited to learn uh, the town council supported, um, you know, utilizing uh, municipal funding to, to support uh, school projects such as uh, roofs and some of the things that were identified. But we have more work to do, but we were pleased um, with the town council recognizing that that's a, a prudent uh, way to fund uh, school uh, facilities. So we, we have some work to do, but it was a very positive meeting, and we appreciate the town council's support. Um, uh, in, in that efforts. Thank you, Michael. <clears throat> David? Um, one clarification, when you said municipal uh, support for the uninitiated, it's not the municipal side giving us money or lending us money, it's really support for a bond that's gonna go, or bonds might go to a taxpayer. They're still coming from the taxpayer, it's not shifting a fund from the municipal side to the school side. Some people just tend to think when you hear municipal, it's the town versus the school. The other thing is um, on the insurance task force, just to let you know, we've finished the uh, request for uh, proposals to hire an expert. It's been published. I think the date for um, all proposals is this month? January 18th. January 18th, at which time we will review them and um, interview if, if there are if there's some good candidates, we'll interview them and hopefully uh, um, hire somebody and get start the process of reviewing our health plans versus the marketplace. Great, thank you. Uh, any other committee reports? We at uh, Technology will have a meeting on January 17th at 2.30 in this building. Great, is that the first? Technology Committee meeting or? Second. Second one. Um, all right, item eight, school board agenda requests. I have two, I have substance abuse and um, potentially student reporting written down. St student reporting. Michael raised that as a possible future topic. 
how we collect data and report data on students. Okay. Should Anything else? Questions? Any other agenda requests? Okay. Meredith, on the uh, student, obviously, given the uh, the desire to broaden communication um, and dialogue and substance abuse, if that's going to be a lengthy presentation, feel free to uh, move the the student reporting and student data to a, a different uh, meeting. I'd be happy to work with board leadership around setting the agenda. <laughs> uh, Upcoming meetings that we've touched on many of them. January 22nd is the school board workshop. Okay. And I believe January 25th for a school board retreat. Any other upcoming meetings we've, we need to announce? Okay. Um, Madam 10 adjournment, do I have a motion? I move that we adjourn. Seconded. All those in favor. Thank you. Moving things along. Our job. <laughs>